Hello members, welcome and good evening one and all. My name is Anna Spooner and I'm from the Tastings and Events team at the Wine Society and joined us behind, joining us rather, behind the scenes uh, this evening is my colleague Mahesh. So hello Mahesh and thank you for all your support tonight. Um, for anybody that's new, because I know we do have a few newbies this evening, Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm delighted that so many people wanted to, to explore the wines of Oregon with me, and I'm really excited. They are um, particularly special wines. I know Mahesh is actually supposed to be on annual leave this week, and we're so excited uh, and looking forward to tasting some wines as well as uh, helping me out this evening that he's actually chosen to, to break up his annual leave. So we do thank you, Mahesh, but I also don't blame you amazing amazing wines so before we crack on two tiny bits of housekeeping we'll try as we normally do for these focus on and sip size sip size sessions to uh to try and answer questions as we go where we can so please do write them into the q a if you have a question mahesh is going to manage those behind the scenes and then of course you're also welcome as i see some of you already are to use the chat let us know where you are what you're drinking um, please do remember to select everyone, though, from the drop down menu. Otherwise, it will only be Mahesh and myself who see your chat, which would be a terrible shame. Uh, hoping that some of you have the wines this evening. If not, don't worry. Like I said in the emails, you don't need them. We are going to talk more broadly about the state of Oregon and the wines produced there. But of course, if you are tasting along, I'll let you know when to taste. We're going to go in the order of the Pinot Blanc the uh, Chardonnay and finally the Pinot Noir at the end. But of course, if you've got something else in your glass, then I hope that you're enjoying that too. So without further ado, I am going to pop my oh, pop my uh, screen up because uh, I think it's really important. What we're not going to do in this session is go into a, into a sort of exploratory uh, how, what are the wines of the USA like? Because uh, some of you may have been with me and joined me on that session earlier in the year but this is really about focusing on Oregon so we're not going to talk about too much about things like prohibition um, and and the Great Depression and things that were very important in general in American viticulture we're just going to focus really solely on what makes Oregon so special um, so where is it uh, it's on the 45th parallel, so it's actually on the same parallel as Bordeaux. However, everybody calls it the other Burgundy or, or likens it to Burgundy. And we'll go on to talk a little bit about why that is. But, um, you know, why, even though it's on the same parallel as Bordeaux, why does it have a climate and a terroir more associated with Burgundy? Um, one of the reasons, I suppose, that's really important to say compared to the rest of um, American viticulture as we know it is that the production in in Oregon is really small scale and it's neat little wineries uh, no sorry the opposite neat little rows of vineyards and then shacks for wineries or certainly it was so in some ways I suppose that's quite similar to Burgundy um, but the focus really is on small batch wine making now it was small scale but now there are 900 nearly a thousand wineries well over 500 tasting rooms so it is big business but the producers aren't that vast in size even some of the key players that we've got here today in the grand scheme of the wine world they're still um small in scale so it would not be a focus on event without a touch of history um, and oregon although it has a very short history um again relative to the wine world uh, it does have a fruitful one so Technically, grape growing, grow, grape growing dates back in Oregon to the 1850s. A gentleman called Peter Britt, um, who I'm sure wouldn't have pronounced his name like that. It would probably have been Pietro Britt. Uh, he was a Swiss gentleman and he planted mission grapes in the Rogue Valley, um, but very much experimental. He was a fruit farmer, so he wasn't a viticulturalist. He wasn't a winemaker. The real kickoff was uh, in 1961. And I hope that you can see my slide now. Uh, 1961, so post-prohibition, but we're not going to dwell on it. A gentleman called Richard Summer, who is the guy on your left, planted a load of grapes at Hillcrest Vineyard in the Umqua Valley. And he planted loads of stuff. Riesling, Gewurztraminer, Chardonnay, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, loads and loads of varieties. And he's the first gentleman to really produce commercial vitis vinifera, i.e. 
European grape variety grapes. Um, in 1965, David Lett, who is the gentleman on the right hand side of your screen, so the one holding the holding the cuttings, he planted the per first Pinot Noir in Willamette Valley. I'm um, sorry, Willamette Valley. I said I was going to pronounce it correctly this evening. Willamette, damn it, for anyone who's not sure. <laughs> but he planted the first Pinot Noir in Willamette Valley. And he was told by UC Davis that Pinot Noir would not grow here. This was not a good idea. Uh, one couple did trust him, the Kuris, and they let him plant some, they let let plant some vines in his nursery under their name. Um, but David and his wife moved the vines um, when they eventually found, uh, I think he picked up his wife sort of, part vineyard worker, part, part spouse is the way their son describes it. Uh, and they moved the wine, the vines, sorry, from their nursery up to Irie Vineyards, which is actually a wine that we stock. We're not tasting it this evening, um, but I've got a bottle, um, Irie Vineyards in the Dundee Hills, um, which is part of Willamette Valley, I should mention. But uh, the David was sort of monumental in Pinot Noir in Willamette, David and his wife. And because of that, that's really where um, Oregon has shone in Willamette Valley Pinot. But uh, so we've had 61 with Soma coming in, 65 with David Lett planting the first Pinot Noir in Willamette, and then 67, Soma, who's on your left, produced his first wine. Technically, that was the first Oregon Pinot on record, and safe to say he quit his day job. Um, it was rather good. So various people have at this point start to drip into the region but um these two guys really were one of the turning points um the final person i think it's worth mentioning who we don't have a photo of and i apologize i should do um is david alsheim adel sorry adelsheim adelsheim um he worked a harvest in burgundy and then in the early 70s uh realized that the pinot noir clones in burgundy were doing a really good job in Burgundy and the stuff that they've been given by the American UC Davis to grow in in um, Oregon, which were Californian clones, were no good. So the quality of the plant material just did not suit Oregon. They were basically trying to grow something that grows in California in Oregon. And they said, no, no, no. It took them 10 years to get Dijon clones from Burgundy into Oregon. And in the meantime, our first wine elk cove is established. Um, so you can kind of see that there's it's this sort of slow chipping away at quality. But during the 60s and 70s, there's a very small group of people who are at the epicenter of making that happen. Um, in terms of the what when when was it put on the map? Well, that wasn't wasn't until 1979 when the Irie Vineyards. So this particular producer, their 75 Pinot from um, South Block their reserve Pinot, it came top 10 in the blind tasting in Paris. And from then on, people started to listen. So very famously, Burgundian producers started to buy plots of land in Oregon, saying, hold on, this might be the best site for Pinot Noir outside of Burgundy. Um, and then I suppose one really big change if you're a massive wine geek like me is in the 80s a gentleman called h, h. scott N. henry uh, spotted that the pinot was in decline sort of 10 15 years in wasn't getting enough sun exposure and created the scott henry system for trellising which uh, opens up the canopy to more sunlight and it's really famous around the world so uh, if you yeah if you're so inclined to geek out that's why it was invented it was invented in oregon to get more sunlight into the vines um I think that's probably enough. I mean, we can talk about we can talk about the culture. Sideways did amazing things, the film, so the 2004 film actually about California, but it talks about Pinot being the ultimate great variety and so Pinot Noir from Oregon sort of ro rode on the coattails of that, I suppose. Um but yes, lots of movements, things like uh, gets his own AVA in the 80s. As I mentioned, lots of Burgundian producers coming in, um, like the Druins, were a huge step in the 80s. So that is the history in a nutshell. And I think it's really important to cover that off because it's so um, instrumental in Firstly, what we'll talk about later, which is why Pinot Noir is so dominant, because it is such a special place to grow Pinot Noir, but also in this culture of small producers, experimental producers, and people realizing that the cl climate is so much cooler 
Um, and because of that cool climate, very much cooler than California. I'm going to show you some maps in a minute and explain why it's even cooler than Washington as well, which is further north. Doesn't make any sense, but it does make sense. Um, and because of this cool climate, you start to get grapes that are not as commonly grown in California or Washington that you can find either side of it. And you start to get grapes such as our next wine. Nice segue. wasn't intentional, but there we go. Um, our next wine or first wine, I should say, which is the Pinot Blanc from Elk Cove. Um, why do I say it's a nice segue? Well, all of the grapes that have produced the wines that are in our lineup tonight are happy in cool climates or cooler to moderate climates. They're not hot climate varieties. And these small band of brothers were starting to realise that as early as the 70s and just chipped away at quality up until now. So it's been sort of 50 years of bliss producing quality, uh, quality grapes in Oregon. So let's talk about our wine. Let's talk about Elk Cove for a start. Uh, Elk Cove, I mentioned uh, one of the early adopters. So it was really nice to be able to show a a vineyard or a winery, I should say, this evening that was one of those early producers. 74, I think, was when Pat and uh, Joe Campbell planted their first vines for Elk Cove. They, uh, When they first started, there were less than 10 wineries in the whole state. They lived in a trailer. Um, I thought I had a photo of them. Annoyingly, that might be another presentation. If you go on the Elk Cove website, you can find all of these amazing old pictures. But they lived in a trailer whilst they turned the barn into the winery. Um, and it's in the foothills of the Coast Range Mountains. It is in Willamette Valley. So we've got sort of uh, shallow, rough soils, really tricky to grow, uh, you know, but in a good way, you get the vine nice and stressed. Beautiful, beautiful place. And 2021... Um, which is where uh, the year that this wine is from, was an outstanding year at Elk Cove. So we had really cool weather, moderate temperatures during the growing season. So you get this lovely big harvest, but nice and tense, concentrated fruit. You don't have to pick really early to avoid um, to avoid things going too alcoholic. Um, hillside vineyards on Elk Cove, they've got a few. So um, this comes from a handful of vineyards they've got uh, vineyard in Mount Richmond, things like that. Um, and the vines aren't too old. They're six, a blend of six to 28 years. So they're not super old. Uh, they do whole bunch press. We'll see that that's quite a common theme actually in Oregon. They're quite keen on whole bunch pressing. I've got a whole hour session on whole bunch pressing, so I won't go into it too much, but it can do to, uh, to aromatic white grapes. It can act as a little bit of a filter so that you get pressed juice. If you imagine you're putting all of the the stems in as well it can allow the juice to trickle down rather than getting all mushed up and so you get a really light perfume style uh, for the reds because we have got a bit of a whole bunch I'll talk about that when we get to it but um, a whole bunch can be a complicated a complicated thing to just throw throw in there um, but this is whole bunch pressed and it preserves some of that aromatic freshness and again another thing they do to do that is they ferment it at cool cool temperatures and in stainless steel so it's an Alsatian variety. It's actually a Burgundian variety as well. They grew a lot of Pinot Blanc and Burgundy uh, and some in the Loire. Um, not very much. Um, but it's it's known for being kind of a little a little plump, but not not as plump as sort of an Alsatian Pinot Gris, should we say. Um, but certainly a little bit plump, very aromatic, white flowers, apples, lemons, all those sorts of things. Um, I think this is lovely. I'm getting a little bit of uh, sort of light melon, uh, slightly more tropical. Although it's cool in Oregon, it still does get lovely amounts of sunshine. And we'll smell sunshine in our wines. I know it's a weird thing to say, but we'll smell it. Don't you worry. Not, Cali not California sunshine, different kind of sunshine. Um, but yeah, I'm getting lovely kind of green, um, almost like a bell pepper aroma as well, which is really nice. And that shows that cool climate because Pinot Blanc could be much more tropical if you let it get too much ripeness. So having a taste. Mm. Mm. So for me, it's got lovely freshness. It's got that plump round palette that I mentioned, kind of juicy. It feels like a kind of ripe peach in the mouth with that lovely texture. Um, a tiny bit of salt and salinity, which I think is brilliant. 
Uh, so a bit of salt, a bit of lemon. It's really, really nice fresh wine. It's probably, dare I say it, slightly the wrong kind of year for this. Just moving, actually, sunny day down down in the uh, down in Essex today. So I probably could have enjoyed this outside with a glass of um, glass of wine and a I don't know jumper. But <laughs> but very very nice um, end of summer or certainly beginning of spring wine for me. Um, Oh, Mark's made a really interesting point that the best Pinot Blanc for him is in um, the Alto Adige, so northern Italy and Germany. Yes, they do make really good um, Pinot, Pinot Bianco uh, or Weiss Burgunder are the names in those countries. Um, I think Oregon makes cracking Pinot Blanc. Um, we'll go through the varieties in a bit. It doesn't make very much of it. So it's quite a rare wine. Um, but I hope that you, um, yeah, I hope that you enjoy um right let's go on to weather and I'm going to show you a map talking about the weather because I think we need to discuss that sooner rather than later because the weather is key um so Oregon in general so for anyone who's not familiar with where it is we've got Washington to the north California to the south you've actually got Nevada down here in the south as well and then Idaho now um one thing that's slightly odd about Oregon is some of the AVAs you'll see they look like they've been cut off where you can see hopefully my cursor they have so it actually shares some AVAs some Appalachian if you want to call it that um they it actually shares half and half with Washington and half and half with Idaho as well I will talk about those in a minute but for now I'll just focus on the weather because I think before we go into technical legally what's what let's just talk about why this cool climate is important it is cool and it is cloudy the Pacific Ocean influence, it can be seen all down that Californian coast. We've spoken about it a bit in the Napa. Um, sorry, we didn't. We've not had the Napa session yet. Uh, in the in the California and USA session, um, we speak about it when we talk about Chile, even down in the Southern Hemisphere. The Pacific Ocean has a huge influence here. The varieties that grow in Oregon are those cool climates. So the Alsatians, the Burgundians, arguably the Champagne, although um, sparkling is not very popular in Oregon. The quality of the still wine is so exceptional. Um, but it's also got lots of mountain ranges and you can see lots of river tributaries in lots of the AVAs. Um, and those river tributaries, tributaries give lots of different aspects, but also an, um, an altitude. So we have ocean influence. We have altitudinal mountains. We have the more northerly latitude. Now, what that does, I've mentioned already, it is cooler than California. It is actually cooler than Washington because of this mountain influence. Washington's actually quite um, a desert state. Now, lots of the middle of Oregon here are desert like. And to be honest, so is Snake River Valley to some extent, although you can even see here on this Idaho border, mountain, 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 essential. Um, but what it does mean is the northerly, northerly latitude is going to give you a longer growing day than California. So you actually get more sunshine hours, but they're not as warm. And grapes really like that. So long days, cool climates, you've got the ideal cool climate growing conditions. And I mentioned earlier, it's on the same latitude as Bordeaux, but Bordeaux doesn't have the same very brisk. It has some ocean influence, but lots of that is... Um, mediated should we say um by the um oh my gosh the name is escaping me i'm having a complete blank by there's a there's a forest a huge forest that's going to remain nameless and it's in the tributaries well it's in it's in the mouth of the river also takes off a little bit of um of the cooling influence of the ocean there actually what ends up in bordeaux is they just get the rain don't get me wrong it's very cloudy in oregon but we're not getting as much rain as bordeaux it's certainly more similar to burgundy in terms of the cool and long season so let's talk about AVAs now that we've explained temperature. There are currently, and you have to keep up to date with the Americans because they like to keep adding them. To my knowledge, 21. Um, yes, <laughs> the Lalands Forest, thank you. Um, gosh, I had a real bl brain blank there on the um, forest name of, of Bordeaux, which is absolutely a sackable offence. Uh, <laughs> so there are 21 AVAs at the moment in Oregon, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but if we just quickly start with those easterly ones, um, let's start at the top. Columbia Valley, which within it, there's a thing in America called nested AVAs, where you have things inside the big AVAs. So we've got Columbia Valley, this big northeasterly uh, Washington 
shared area. So this encompasses Walla Walla. Um, so that's a, a Washington, Oregon one. It's warm and it's got low rainfall. So actually up here, we're much better for the red varieties that we don't really give as much attention to because we consider them more in Washington. But actually Walla Walla in Oregon is still very good for things like your Syrah, Cabernet, Merlot. Tends to be that we say Walla Walla, um, Washington State. Yeah, that's really good for Cabernet. Actually, there is some good in uh, over the border in um, Oregon as well. It's interesting because it's a state division. But if if the USA, we thought of it as a whole country, we'd probably just talk about Walla Walla being great for those kind of red varieties that need the warmth and don't need too much rain. Um, Columbia Gorge, which is just along here, uh, just north of Mount Hood. Um, the climate varies here. So right on the um, right on the east by the Cascade Mountains, um, you have the. Uh, no, sorry. Yes. Sorry, it's right on the east um, and you've got this Cascade Mountain thing here. So this is where you get the cool influence, the easterly mountains, yes. Um, but if you go 40 miles towards the rest of Columbia Gorge, so 40 miles east, then that turns more desert-like. And it's something mad like 40 inches of rainfall down to 10 inches of rainfall. But there's lots of elevation, as you'd expect, in the gorge. Um, and these do tend to be riper still, although they're not as ripe as Walla Walla, but they are riper certainly than these West Coast ones. Um, and then let's quickly talk about Snake River as well before we go on to the big strip of the sort of um, of the bits we're talking about a bit more today. But Snake River shared with Idaho, as I mentioned, um, it's quite sparse on the Oregon side here. So unlike Walla Walla, where there are some uh, decent amount of vineyards, it's pretty sparse. Um, on the flip side for Idaho, it's the most populated Idaho AVA, but it's hot days. It is cool nights. It's quite desert like and there are still some mountain ranges, but it's it's very, very dry. It's an area that is on the up. So keep your eyes peeled for Snake River Valley AVA. But let's jump down because uh, we're going to talk mainly about the southern Oregon area and Willamette Valley. So southern Oregon, there's lots of exciting stuff going on here. And um, it is a bit warmer, so it's further south, it's nearer the equator. So Cabernet does start to ripen here really nicely. And actually, one thing that's very fun here is that um, Tempranillo, so the Spanish grape in the majority grape for Rioja, is doing very well in southern Oregon. And there's a huge movement for Tempranillo in southern Oregon. So there we go. Um, but in the very southern part, we've got Rogue Valley and Applegate. Uh, Rogue Valley, pretty near the coast, you might remember, well, it's about 70 miles, but you still get some coastal influence. But you might remember this is where that Swiss gentleman, Pieter Britt, set up his fruit farms. Um, Applegate is within that. So you kind of have the nest where you have Southern Oregon, Rogue Valley, and then Applegate. Um, up here, I won't dwell on anything too much in the more northern part of Southern Oregon, but I will mention Umpqua Valley um, because that was where I mentioned that first ever Pinot was planted um, ever, ever, ever. So cool climates here again. You've got enough ocean influence, 50 inches or so of rainfall. So more than north, but still not absolutely masses. Um, Pinot does thrive here, but there are other varieties produced as well. And now let's get into the the heartland, Willamette Valley, arguably the finest wine producing appellation in America, many would say. Um, it's 50 miles from the coast. So, you know, still a decent, a decent way. But you, what you'll see is there are pockets or channels, I should say, where it gets through. Um, it's, it's protected on the east by this Cascade Mountain range. And what that means is, um, first of all, you get some elevations. That's nice. Uh, you get some cool breezes. Also nice. Uh, but you also have um, all sorts of little uh, channels. Uh, there are some famous ones that suck the cold air in as well. The Within Willamette Valley, there are 11 nested AVAs within Willamette. So you can choose to um, produce wines and write Willamette. And a lot of people are doing that because it's so famous. But there are other... Um, Appalachians within Willamette becoming famous in their own right. So Dundee Hills, we've just spoken about, and the um, Aola Amity, which is actually where the next two wines are from, and they are the most famous. So those are these two here. 
Uh, this isn't all of them, by the way. This is a slightly dated map. Um, Dundee Hills is the heartland of quality Pinot Noir production. Rolling Hills, it looks the most like Burgundy. Um, and Irla Amity is the one most influenced, so just here by Salem, is the most influenced by one of those corridors. And it's got the best name ever, the Van Dusa Corridor. Uh, the Van Dusa Corridor has actually now got its own AVA. But it, the cold air floods in through the gap in the mountain range. So um, actually, the grapes in Eolamity are some of the latest ripening. In terms of soils, there's huge complexity in Willamette as well. For Eolamity, they're probably the most prized. So you've got quite a volcanic soil here. You've got a volcanic loess and some sedimentary rock. If you imagine that you're so near the coast here, um, what you tend to get, and I remember it's probably a good, a good point for me to go on to this next wine, actually, because it is Neil Amity Hills. I remember meeting, uh, here's just an example. How delightful. That's actually Elk Cove. Sorry. Um, that's a, I knew I had a nice photo of Elk Cove. Uh, very, very neat vines and then sort of, um, you know, big old barns. It's nothing glamorous and it's in the middle of nowhere. Um beautiful part of the world but um let's talk about salem uh the salem chardonnay oh the salem wine company i should say because it's a good time to talk about soils as we're doing that um when i so i was lucky enough to meet sashi moorman who is one of the producers of this wine i think i've got a photo of them here we go so rajat par very famous sommelier teamed up with sashi moorman uh i actually met them in their um california winery or sorry i met sashi at least um <laughs> And they, Sashi is obsessed with soils, um, amongst other things. He's a real meticulous winemaker. Um, and one of the reasons they were getting so excited about this project, I think I met them in 2017, and I think they started this in 14, but from vines that have been planted since 1984. But they bought the vines in 2014, and they were getting very excited about this project because of the soils. Um, there's this amazing sedimentary rock. Um, there are these patchworks, which is why it often gets considered the new Burgundy, because there are pockets of different layers. It's so near the sea that all of this sort of um, yeah, beautiful layering of soils has happened. Um, but that sedimentary rock is supposedly what gives the wines their finesse. And so the volcanic glows combined with the, um, the, the sedimentary uh, calcium carbonates, so the Dead Sea sea fossils and things like that um but on this wine let's go back to it because it's delicious and i want to taste it <laughs> so uh Ola Amity, like i said a blend of three sites of the region uh the bigger project so the wine sits under a bigger project called evening lands and evening lands is is owned by rajat and sashi and um they bought some vineyards and evening lands is like the top wine and then um whilst they're waiting for the grapes to get ready, then they produce um, this wine. And actually this particular wine, so the Salem Wine, Salem wine Company, the soils are slightly more clay-based and actually it's more similar. The soils for this wine are more similar to the outfit in Santa Barbara, which is this kind of clay with sedimentary rock. Um, there's also a bit of iron in this soil as well, which I will be really honest with you, I can't tell you what that does. Um, there's so many debates about what iron rich soils do. Um, but certainly the clay plus calcium is is a bonus and very much mirrors or, or is close to what they're working with in Santa Barbara. Um, it is uh, this particular one of the particular sites as well. Seven Springs is really, really sought after because it has that amazing Van Dusa corridor influence. So cool climate. They take huge care on these um on these vines they hand harvest everything they are very organic they really look after everything and um even in the winery a lot of attention to detail but a hands-off approach so they press into um 500 liter pouchons so 500 liter old oak barrels um they use native yeasts so they don't add any any um uh but bought yeast makes it sound horrible, but they, they use the yeast that comes in from the vines rather than adding any. Um, they make the wine go through malolactic fermentation or malolactic conversion. So they make uh, they add a um, 
an agent that will convert those malic acids, green apple acids, into lactic milky acids. Um, it's actually a bacteria that does that technically. Um, and then they let the wine, that gives it this mouthfeel. And they want the wine to have texture and richness, but not oak influenced flavor. So that MLF, that malolactic, that's going to that's going to add to the mouthfeel. And then they leave it for 12 months in the oak. But the oak is neutral. So it's not imparting flavor. It's just bringing texture. So. Hopefully, and I definitely don't. So they've they've delivered on their promise. You're not getting this kind of vanilla fruity tutti um, Chardonnay. You're getting something quite refined. And again, we're talking about mirroring some Burgundian practices here. Burgundy do use some new oak sometimes, but only in really like um, opulent southern uh, areas in the Cote d'Or or very, very warm vintages where it might need it. Or, um, But a lot of Burgundian Chardonnay actually isn't uh, aged in, in big oak. And I think this is a perfect example of that. So, yeah, I've got a bit of smokiness and a bit of salinity and those are quite classic particularly of this particular pair uh, Raja and Sashi love that slightly flinty note um that can be got through a bit of reductive winemaking um and also a lemony spritzy smell it's not going to taste spritzy don't worry but that kind of really fresh lemon and lime in the nose and some white flowers it's got quite a gentle aroma to it in some ways um have a little taste. I love this wine so much. Mm. Mm. So it doesn't knock you over the head with, you know, sweet vanilla or, or pineapple-y tropical aromas. It's a really refined, very, very sophisticated Chardonnay. So all of those lemons, it's actually quite green apple for me, considering they've put it through malolactic fermentation. I suspect they've kept some of it back. It's got great acidity, very, very fresh, very vibrant. And that salinity, that kind of salty, um, slightly savoury note, it makes it so food friendly. I cannot tell you. It's um, it's this kind of gorgeous um I want to have a piece of fish with this immediately, that lemon, that salt. I'm getting a few herbal notes as well, dried herbs, maybe. Um, this is going to sound very pretentious, but it's only because I've cooked with it recently and it's coming to me. Uh, fenugreek um, is um, is uh, this beautiful kind of aromatic herb. I can see a few people on the chat asking about reductive uh, and also asking to compare. So reductive winemaking, I'll be relatively brief, but I'll try and explain it as best I can. When you're making wine, um, there are lots of opportunities for oxygen to come into contact with the wine. So the, the options that you might have are uh, things like pumping over for a red wine. So moving the juice around, racking the juice off and putting it back on the top. Now uh, for red wines, that can be really important. You might want the oxygen. It tends to um give give the tannins a little massage but it can also affect the flavor in really positive ways as well and there are lots of very famous oxidative wines where they go to real extremes and encourage oxygen to come into play with the juice too much oxygen and you've got a fault um too little oxygen all the way on the other end of the spectrum and you've got a fault as well but most winemakers play within that middle area which is great but within that middle area you've got styles that have more oxygen and then styles that really avoid oxygen. And one of the things that when you avoid oxygen in white wines and Chardonnay picks it, up, picks it up particularly well, is you can get a kind of struck match or a flinty character. Um, it's a character that was that can be found in naturally in things like Chablis or Sancerre, that flinty struck match character. Um, and those two wines, one made with Chardonnay, one made with Sauvignon, they can particularly expressively show beautiful reduction and I think because those wines are so popular a lot of wine producers now say okay well people love those wines I'm going to behave slightly more reductively than the centre so um, it tends to be a character that if you leave your wine open or in the glass it will actually go away so for me it's it's great because I'm, I'm getting it now but I might not get it on my second glass later 
Um, so it, for me, it adds an extra interesting element of character. But there are people that don't like it. So Sarah Knowles, MW, our buyer loves it. Joe Locke, MW, another buyer absolutely hates it. So um, it's a personal preference, productive wine making. But it's definitely a scale. People can go too far. Um, and then a couple quick other comparisons. James has asked in style, how does this compare with Kumu River Chardonnays from New Zealand? I think that's a lovely question, James, because actually um, Michael Brakovich MW is notorious for making slightly reductive Chardonnays. So I think certainly in that ilk, we're on a similar on a similar wavelength here. Um, I would say that there's maybe a little bit more opulence in the Kumu River Chardonnays. I don't think this is quite as opulent. I think this is a bit more um restrained uh a bit less expressive i'd say i get a bit less fruit on the kumu river chardonnay is what uh, michael brackovich does that's so incredible is get all this fruit with all this salinity savory uh i mean it's it's just mad how much he can get into his chardonnays but that is his specialty um so he does an amazing job um tim jones has asked how would you compare the chardonnay with uh with Chardonnays from Santinez Valley and then Au Bon Climat question mark. Um, so Au Bon Climat for members that don't know uh, Santinez Valley, part of the Santa Rita Hills and Santa Barbara Appalachian in Southern California. Um, it's a hard, that's a hard one. There's a so first of all degrees of alcohol. Um, there will be less alcohol in the Salem wines than you would find down in uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, and I do find that the fruit nature in Santa Barbara can be slightly different. Yes, there's cooling influence, but you are getting much more intense uh, sunshine. Well, actually, not much more intense, but I would say just generally there's a bit more, again, giving fruit. I don't think there's as much giving fruit here. That's not to say all Oregon Pinots are are less fruity, but I'd say that, um, again, your Obon Climats are going to be a slightly more opulent nature. Obon Climat has never really... Um, styled itself on burgundy they very much do their own thing whereas i feel like these these guys are styling themselves definitely on a burgundian uh vibe um and then lastly andrew dog point from new zealand is often quite reductive struck match yes absolutely um particularly a lot of new zealand producers making sauvignon blanc sauvignon blanc and, and chardonnay are the two great varieties that um that do tend to take to reductive wine making the best um but yeah i would say yes 100 percent dog point you're going to get um on their chardonnay and their sauvignon you'll definitely get reduction so if you're not sure on on what it looks like or smells like uh you can't really taste reduction per se but if you're not sure on what it smells like then that new um dog point would be a great a great place to start i love it i think it makes it really interesting and like i said it's one of those beautiful things that as, as the wine comes into contact with the oxygen it will sort of go away um Right, let's talk about some great varieties whilst we're on it. Um, I'd love to know what you think of that wine. Um, I love that wine. I think it's very good value, if I'm honest. Um, there's a lot of expensive wine in Oregon. Uh, the evening landing wines from Sailor, uh, from from Sashi and Rajat as well, I should say, are particularly good. Uh, so if you do get opportunity, I think we've got one on the website at the moment. If you do get an opportunity, I think they're about five pounds more expensive. Uh, but you're just going to get a bit more give. So um, a bit less restrained and a bit more generous. Um, right, let's go through, let's just go through these from top to bottom, shall we? And I'll go through them nice and quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, we're going to talk properly about Pinot Noir in a minute. So um, I'm always going to park the 59% Pinot Noir. But as you can see, I said earlier, it's important to know the history of Oregon to understand that Pinot was so popular and it was a calling card and people were constantly saying this is the best place for Pinot Noir outside of Burgundy. And then the Burgundians came. And so therefore they just cemented the fact that, that it was the grape. Um, so no wonder it's planted in such high quantities. Again, the other thing is, is that there are little pockets of different soil types from your more irony clays. Um, here at Evening Landing and Seven Springs, right through to your very, very sedimentary rocks. Um, so those different pockets and patchworks do act like burgundy. So they allow for lots of different styles of Pinot. Um, and we will have one. So that is, um, that's Pinot Noir for you. Nearly uh, two thirds of the entire, uh, of the entire operation. We've then got Pinot Gris. Now, <clears throat> 
we haven't had a Pinot Gris, we've had a Pinot Blanc, which isn't even on here. So less than 1% is produced. But Pinot Gris is um, made in the more Alsace style. So rather than Northern it Italian Pinot Grigio, they're often quite rich, quite floral. Um, I don't know why I'm looking at that wine. We've not had one. Um, some lemon, but certainly in Alsace style rather than of Northern Italian style. Um, they are very generous. They have been, up until this point, the most popular white wines of Oregon. I would argue that that is changing. There is a big shift to that 7% of Chardonnay. And that is because, um, well, first of all, the Pinot Gris, that they, they do make it in a dry style, but they're often very rich. And um, there's been a slight trend, I suppose, to move away from those very, very rich styles of Pinot Gris, which I think is a shame. I read, I have to say, make some absolutely stonking Pinot Gris. So if you ever see it for sale on the website, um, grab, grab, grab a bottle of the Pinot Gris. But there is a move away from that style. And the move is uh, certainly towards Chardonnay, uh, if anything. One of the problems with Chardonnay historically here was we talked about the clones of Pinot Noir not being right originally. Unfortunately, UC Davis got the clones of Chardonnay wrong as well. Again, it comes back to trying to grow, grow those different clones from California that are a bit richer and a bit opulent, but they didn't like the wet weather. It's much wetter than, say, um, you know, your, your Sonomas or your Santa Barbaras. So it didn't like the wet. Um, so now that the clone material is better, it's just going from strength to strength. And because there are these microclimates and micro terroirs, there isn't a unifying style. So it's very hard to pick out an Oregon Chardonnay in a blind tasting. You really can find everything from, from the kind of Chard Chardonnays that are Chablis-esque right through to the very, very rich. And I think we probably had something slightly in the middle. But if I was going to place it anywhere, I'd move it towards that more Chablis style with that slightly reductive note. Um, so it's 7% and rising. You'll notice that all of these were very, very popular in Willamette. So Noir, Gris and Chardonnay, very good in Willamette. And then Pinot Noir and Gris in Southern Oregon, that area where original plantings happened. So the kind of um, the heartland of where it started before Willamette got um, got busy. Um, and again, yeah, Rogue Valley for similar reasons. Um, where is, oh, I've just had a question, where's the Pinot Blanc on the scale? If we're talking about the scale of richness, uh, Alsace rather than Northern Italy, this is definitely an Alsace style. There's no two ways about it. Um, the, the texture alone, you could, I could have a stinking cold and not be able to smell anything and I'd still call that an Alsace Pinot uh, Blanc because it is rich. Um, it's, it's not the Alto Adige, Northern Italy, um, oh, and percentage planted is less than one percent, if that's the if that's what you were saying. But Pinot Gris is what I was talking about for the Pinot Grigio versus Pinot Gris from Alsace. But the Pinot Blanc is certainly an Alsace style too. And as I mentioned, they've taken a lot of learnings from Alsace, Champagne, Burgundy. Um, Syrah four percent. I've spoke earlier about. I spoke earlier about how that northern section is much warmer. Um, you have less influence from the Pacific Ocean. You start to get slightly uh, drier, well, significantly drier areas. So um, the Syrah is, it in world terms, it's cooler than lots of parts of the world where Syrah grows. Um, I'm thinking southern Australia, where really warm Shiraz grows. So I would probably put this in northern Rhone rather than southern Rhone territory if I had to pick a style. You know, if you said, OK, well, where where would you most associate? Definitely more on the northern Rhone than southern. Um, and it's more savoury than it is fruity. And again, for that reason, I'm not going to call it one of the, you know, it's not a big uh, vacillas fruit fruit forward styles is definitely more on the northern co-roti-esque um, sphere uh, but not huge quantities so only four percent likewise Cabernet Sauvignon only four percent uh, here we've got Columbia and Rogue Valley so we've got almost two opposites of the spectrum Columbia um, particularly uh, as I mentioned famous for Cabernet and more famous for Washington so Columbia Valley Walla Walla um, always very famous for Washington State Cabernet. Um, get, Oregon gets a bit overlooked. Um, there is cool climate, but you can get to full ripeness. Um, and you will often find that people are blending in some things like Merlot or something to battle the slight austerity because it doesn't have that rich nature that you find in a sunnier spot like Napa. 
<clears throat> so for for what has historically been a very popular style of wine, i.e. rich, big Cabernets, they have been blending in things to beef it up. I suspect in the future they won't. Um, somebody's commented saying, interesting that I put Sh Syrah, not Shiraz. I, I have never, and I bet someone will find one, I've never seen an Oregon Shiraz to this day. Um, they are Oregon's entire ethos is that we are that the region is a European uh, style, you know, even down to this new rise in Temple and EO, they're mirroring Spain, which has been a shift away from mirroring France, which is what they've done. But they very much are taking lead and learnings. And uh, it's almost like they came late to the party, but because of it, they watched everybody else and went, hmm, yeah, you guys know what you're doing. Um, so they've very much taken that European influence of style rather than the um, the Australian style of Syrah. So, yeah, good point, but intentionally, uh, intentionally so. Um, and then last but not least, Riesling. I love Riesling from Oregon, but it's really hard to find. Um, high acid can be dry or off dry. It can be both. Um, it's more, again, in the Alsace style. You can get some sort of verging on German. But I think the problem is you're getting so many rich and dry styles in Germany now that it's quite hard. It's it's getting increasingly hard to tell the difference between those. Um, but yes, what I would say is the Rieslings are really special because of that beautiful high acidity. Willamette in particular, the problem is that Pinot grows so well that it's quite hard to start pushing extra plantings of anything other than Pinot into Willamette Valley. But if you do get opportunity to try Riesling from Willamette, I strongly encourage it. Uh, so on that note, um, let's move on. Yeah, let's do it. I'm excited. Let's move on to our Pinot. Um, so I should caveat that this is probably on the more, I was going to say more affordable scale for Pinot from um, Willamette. That's not true. That's unfair. I think you're probably looking at about a £25 starting point for a Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. Let's think about those small quantities that it's made in. It's usually quite a small operation. So it will be, I don't know, in this case, it's launched by a husband and wife duo. It seems to be the thing. Uh, you could argue these are more newcomers. So this was launched in 1992. Um, but it's it's hard work. There's pockets of vines. It's not these big sprawling plains. Um, it's difficult to grow grapes here. And Pinot Noir is a particularly fickle grape variety. So you are really looking yeah, at about £25 by the time it's got here for any uh, Willamette Valley Pinot. And I would probably say £30 plus is going to be where you start to get the good stuff. Um, this uh, particular producer, I think I already mentioned, but if I didn't, I apologise, is also Aeola Amity Hills. So it's got that lovely cooling influence. And I'm going to mention it because it is so important for this wine. Um, the uh, cooling influence here actually does something that you maybe wouldn't think. It kind of does the counter to what you might normally think. So you might think cooling influence, grapes are colder. They're going to be lighter and fresher. You know, they've not had time to fully ripen. And in actual fact, the opposite is sort of true. What happens is those, that amazing Van Duza, um corridor cools the grapes down. It actually cools the grapes down so the skins thicken slightly more. And because the, the growing season can be extended, so you can have this really, really long growing season. Um, I've just been told Kristen's now showing us sold out on the website. Um, I apologise. I was, was for sale this morning. Um, I'll see if we've got any more stock coming in. And if we don't, I will make in a couple of other recommendations in a minute. Um, but if you, um, yeah, if you haven't tried it before, I apologise. I will hope to, hope to see if we can get some more in. But um, it's quite unusual. Aeola Amity Hills, I mentioned, has this long growing season. So any Pinot from an Aeola Amity Hills is going to be that coolest climate. Some of them, if they pick early, get a really light sort of um, almost Germanic style to them. So anybody that likes Schwerbegunder, which I adore, but it's almost this kind of light, slightly fruitier style. If you leave the, <clears throat> pardon me, if you leave the grapes on longer in this cool climate down at Olamity, you get a really kind of dense black fruit. And that is partly down to the longer you leave them, you get these polyphenols that can ripen for longer in the skins of the grape. You can then afford to actually, because those the, the tannins in the skins have actually fully developed, you can afford to be a bit more forceful with your pressing. Now it's by no stretch of 
deep colored wine but it's definitely got some some looks to it uh as far as pinots go it's it's certainly got color it's not a wimpy wimpy um sort of light pink it's got some dark color to it um and that's coming from those skins and likewise those tannins are too um but in terms of the nose it's really earthy and very dark berries there are some cranberries and those red fruits in there but for me that black fruit nature it's something that you get in places like um central otago where central otago um and and some New Zealand um, pinots for me go very quite very quite go quite black fruited because of their very sunny but cool growing environments. Um, so I'm seeing some similarities there. Um, they are organic and there there's a really amazing organic and sustainable I should say um, what, what would you, initiative called Live in Oregon, which is low input viticulture and enology. And there is this movement towards let's um, let's stop putting um, loads of treatments on our vines and let's stop adding things into the vats when we don't need to. So they've definitely pulled back on that. Um, somebody's asked about the percentage of whole bunch. I do know the answer to that. It's five percent. So five percent is um, we were going to talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about it now. Um, so uh, it's 5% whole cluster. Whole cluster can do a few things to Pinot Noir. Every grape's different about what a whole cluster does. Whole cluster can add a bit of freshness. It can also add some sort of herbaceous notes to it. I've seen a comment saying that it's leafy. Sometimes when it's whole cluster, I get a leafy sense. Um, might not be everyone, but I do get that leafy sense, particularly when there's a tiny bit of whole cluster. It's amazing what 5% will do. Um, it will um, leach some of the colour. So I mentioned as well that the colour was a bit darker. So sometimes it will um, actually take some of the colour out, uh, which probably means that this may have started even darker. Um, yeah, so with only 5%, you're still getting a bit of an influence. I love that you've said peppery, whoever that was. Um, whole, surely a whole bunch means a lot of stalks. Whole bunch means, yeah, 5% of the grapes were put in with their stalks on. Now, these are all farmed by hand, so they're going to be chopping them off anyway. Some go through a destemmer and some don't. So they left 5% with the stalks in. That 5%, they then obviously have to, um, at some point, remove the stalks. But what they'll do is they'll press, after they've left the um, grape satin in the big vat, before they put it into their little barrels, um, they'll have got rid of the stalks. And on that note, it's... Um, just under 15% for new French oak. So that slightly peppery flavour uh, that I'm really glad somebody picked on uh, is, is often associated with kind of barrel, barrel Pinot. And I mentioned again earlier that a lot of the barrel work in Oregon is not really, you know, let's lash loads of flavour on. So 13%, I think, is the amount, um, it's either 13 or 14, it's just under 15% new so they're basically saying we don't want loads and loads of flavor we just want to add that little touch and i do genuinely think that's where that peppery spicy note is coming from um which i think is gorgeous and you tell me i personally get a lot more black fruit than red fruit and most people traditionally would say pinot noir it's going to be all red fruits cranberries and strawberries and cherries and i do get cherries but they're black ones <laughs> um i get some red but they're mainly black um so i'm gonna have a taste Mm. I'm really getting black fruit and do you members who are tasting along can you taste those tannins that is a pinot noir that has been left on the vine for a while and somebody's made a comment on the alcohol being 13 and a half percent now pinot noir realistically you can make good pinot noir at 12 percent. that's not a problem so in the world of pinot noir it's a mid-level alcohol level but for them to have kept the um for them to have kept the grapes on the vines as long as I suspect they have. This is suspicion, by the way, um, but very, very strong suspicion. For them to have kept the grapes on the vine lo a long while like this means that those tannins will have, have developed, but they will also have accumulated more sugars, which produce more alcohol. And so for 13.5%, I would imagine they could have picked this at 12%, but it wouldn't have got this amazing complexity. And it's actually quite a 
it's quite a punchy pinot in the, in the best possible way. It's not a fruit bomb. It's not a, it's a classy, sophisticated, serious, savoury pinot noir. Um, somebody's asked how long it will age. I think you've probably got, I'm going to speak out of turn here. I don't know what Sarah's put. I think you've probably got eight, eight or so years on this. Let's see what Sarah's put and see if, yeah, she's put six. She's very, um, she's very conservative, our buyers. I think you've got eight years on this. Um, again, it's a bit of a finger in the air assessment because I haven't tasted older vintages of it. But in terms of what it can do, um, it's not going to last like a, I mean, red burgundies don't last forever. It's not like, they're not like red Bordeaux's, but um, red burgundies, when they do age, get this kind of meaty, leathery note. I think we were already getting some of that. You know, this is only a two-year-old wine, but I think with that extraction, with that little um, bit of thyme in oak, and some new oak there is a bit of development already so I'm not getting the freshest of fruits I'm getting this kind of more preserved fruits and that slight touch of forest floor um somebody said slight shift of red fruit on the finish yeah I could agree with that yeah it's got this kind of sharp sharp red fruit on the finish um I hope you'll agree really really complex wine and I think a um a fantastic example personally um I think I've got some photos of the vineyards hold on yes I do um so again another lovely part of the world slightly different as you can see here we're still in um so Elk Cove was our first which was actually more hilly Rene Ola Amity here slightly less hilly more rolling I would say and I think I've got a picture oh I don't um I thought I had a photo oh I know where it is it's on the back label <laughs> if anyone has got the wine, there's a lovely little uh, diagram, which I thought I'd got a, a where I'd circled them all. But it's got all of these different blocks, all have different names, and they're named after all the women in the um, Jerry family. So um, it was a, a husband and wife duo that launched this wine, Paul and Eileen. And um, the second generation, so their son, Tom, is now in charge. And all of the Jerry family are sort of um I don't know I don't know how you describe it um eternalized in the names of the vineyards so Eileen one of the founders and Paul's wife has the highest spot which I believe is this bit here I'm gonna check yes well done you can sort of see that it's the highest spot um so if you're so interested that I think again I'm just gonna check yeah so that's about 550 to 750 uh feet above sea level all Pinot Noir uh, and then they've got um, Jesse so they've got Jesse Louise and Marjorie and I can't remember who's who uh, but they've got grandmothers on both sides Pinot Pinot again and then they've got Marjorie who is uh, Paul's mother um, and then they've just introduced I think a Paul vineyard as well so they've got a newly added one after him because I think that seems fair um I mentioned earlier they're very big on biodynamics organics blah 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 blah, blah. Um, but you can see in Oregon the most amazing thing is how neat everything is it blows my mind um and all surrounded by cornfields and things like that it's a very unusual um very unusual part of the world with lots of neat rows and then little shacks or little barns and visitor centers not so much um for anybody who does love Oregon Pinot, you might be so interested that there is Pinot, I think it's called Pinot Fest. Uh, I've, a, a girl on the MW course with me has has just left, but was in charge, I think, of the Oregon um, Association of Educators or something. And she organises the, or is key in the organisation of the Pinot Noir Festival Drinks Party. <laughs> That happens every year and it is genuinely a, it's trade and consumers buyers go from around the world um I can't remember what month that happens I want to say it's April might be a bit later than that um but I would I mean I would desperately love to go but a lot of people come back and say it's very different to California um and it is you know it's, it's really farm based and they talk about farms and other than going to Portland which is sort of hip happening um, but other than Portland, there's not really any urban centres. We are talking about farming here. And, you know, they'll talk about fruit crush and you get a bit of that in California. But in California, you also turn up and have a very smart restaurant and et cetera. And Oregon's not really about that. It's about the quality of the fruit that then goes into produce the quality wines. So I have to say that's one of the reasons that I love Oregon so much. Um, oh, I 
very conscious of time and I'm very upset. Uh, oh, there we go. Richard said it costs one £1,400 or more for three days and it's in the end of July. There we go. Well, I won't be affording it. Um, but if you are a massive Pinot buff, I can't verify that Richard's prices are accurate, but I wouldn't be surprised. I think they basically ship you on buses and and take you around the whole state tasting Pinot by all accounts. I've seen pictures. It looks fabulous. And there's, um, you know, seminars that you can join and things like that. So, uh, yes. And John and Jane have just said when we visited, they were making wine from individual vineyards. However, it looks like this wine is a more gen generic version. I'm assuming you mean the Christum people, John and Jane. Um, yeah, I think they do do. They still produce all their single vineyard wines. This is just a blend and this is their kind of entry level. I hate that word, but it it does the job. Uh, this is their kind of entry level Pinot that is a um, yes. A mix of berries, a mix of berry suppliers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, this is their blend of lots of different, um, lots of different sites rather than. Um, oh, <laughs> Mahesh has just popped something into the uh, into the chat. Thank you, Mahesh. She's just mentioned that I have passed first year of Master of Wine, so I appreciate that very much, Mahesh. Thank you. <laughs> Onwards and upwards to stage two, indeed where I won't be invited to, to Pinot Fest, but hopefully one day. <laughs> but thank you. I'm all embarrassed now. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed this evening. Honestly, I could wax lyrical about Oregon forever. It's such a special place with a really unique proposition. It's um, small scale producers, but lots of them. It's farm focused. You know, there's a big reason why there are so many biodynamic and organic and, and farming focused principles in Oregon. Um, it's farm first and then the wines speak for themselves. I highly recommend browsing the website for any other Oregon options. I'm going to have a quick look now because I did say I was going to promise you another Pinot suggestion if we have one. Uh, I don't know whether Mahesh put it in the chat, but I'll do it in the follow up email because we do have the Evening Land Seven Springs Chardonnay. So the um, the one up uh from from the Salem um I would say that uh it's it's worth trying for five pounds extra or, or I think it's about five pounds extra um and then in terms of Oregon Pinot it looks like we might have just oh we've got what we have got the Lemelson Jerome Reserve Pinot Noir 2018 um that is an absolutely lovely wine it's actually again on the richer end so if you did enjoy this but you're upset that it's it's not around anymore or if you want to try those kind of um uh spicy woody richer styles rather than the the red cherry berry styles then lemelson jerome reserve oregon pinot would be a fantastic option it is a bit more expensive um but again it's sort of 13 and a half percent showing that it's been hanging out on the vine a bit longer and it's more rich in body Right. Oh, I'm sad to leave it. I'm not sad that I can enjoy the rest of my Pinot Noir um, and I'm going to hopefully hide and have a glass before I have to share it with my husband. <laughs> um, who's making burgers, which actually I can't think of a better um, a better and more pleasurable combination than a uh, Pinot Noir and a nice burger. So I hope you have a lovely evening. <laughs> I've just been told to go share. No. Um, I hope you have a lovely evening, everyone. Uh, thanks again to Mahesh behind the scenes. Thank you all for joining me. We do hope to see you soon. And if you are interested in American wines, we've got another Napa session on the way. So, um, yeah, I hope that you will uh, join us for that. And if not, we've got plenty coming up. Uh, we've nearly got all of the Christmas events online, but do keep an eye out for those. And then we'll be starting to put January events. Can you believe it? As of next week. So keep an eye peeled for those as well. Um, I will send a follow up email with links to the wines and I'll find out if we've got any more Christmas coming in. Thank you all very much and see you soon.